On today's Locked On Bucks, we continue our trip down memory lane. It is Flashback Friday, and it is probably the most highly anticipated of those topics that we threw out there. We dig into the 2000-2001 Milwaukee Bucks, a team that seemed like they were poised to be the team on the rise in the Eastern Conference but just one conference finals appearance and a drastically different team after that. So we get into the year, the aftermath, and everything else surrounding that team coming up next on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Bucks. I'm Justin Garcia, joined by Camille Davis. We thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen every day, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on YouTube as well, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Bucks is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Head over to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. And use the code locked on NBA, all lowercase. Use that code for a first deposit match up to $100. Um, Camille, when we uh, threw this idea out there, I think we both expected this, whenever we made it an option for people to vote on, would probably be the topic that garnered the most interest in votes. And, um, as of this moment, it's gotten the most votes of any of the uh, choices we put out there. Although the Jabari Parker topic for next week may be close, but it is the 2000, 2001 Milwaukee Bucks. And I would venture to guess most of the uh, audience for Locked On Bucks, this is the team that you have the most memories of and, and look back the most fondly outside of 2021 and that title team, it's probably this that for many listeners is really your first concrete memories of Bucks basketball. Definitely one of mine. So the 01 season, I was 12 in 01. So uh, this was the year of the Milwaukee Bucks that made me like really start paying attention to the Bucks. Before that, of course, I dibbled and dabbled in it, but I grew up in the 90s. I mentioned it before. I grew up in a house where we had WGN. We watched a lot of Bulls games Bulls, yeah. uh, in my house, a lot of Michael Jordan. So I was a Jordan kid. And when Jordan retired, I was just like, what do I do? And the Bucks had Ray Allen. And it was one of those things where I was like, this, you know, he, I kind of like the way he plays basketball. Um, and then when you get to that 01 season where they make it to that Eastern Conference finals run, I just remember the city's energy around that time because it was the first time I really experienced that around yeah. basketball where – Everyone was talking about it. I remembered that feeling from the Packers Super Bowl runs in 96 and whatnot, where it was just like, wow, like everyone is focused on this. Everyone's watching this. Everyone's cheering for this. Everyone's together. Uh, and seeing it for the Bucks, the first time seeing Milwaukee, you know, getting that attention was so fun for me. And I remember even watching when we started talking about the playoffs, there was a playoff game uh, that was on DJ had on during a middle school dance. And I was watching the game rather than participating in the dance in itself. And that, yeah, th that, those teams, this team was one of one of those ones, Justin. I am a uh, little older than you. So I was old enough to like, that was my formative years. Um, I remember that playoffs very vividly. I was finally old enough to attend playoff games alone. Uh, and I just remember, I didn't go to many, but I remember what it was like outside the Bradley Center when you saw, again, it's an easy comp to make, but in many ways it reminded you of uh, 2019, not 2021, but 19, when we were all pretty sure the Bucks were going to come out of the first round of the playoffs and that there was something with this group so there was this anxiousness and energy that was in there in the building and around the city every single game i couldn't think of anything like that until 20 uh, 2001 i mean you had that interest and excitement around the fear of the deer team but nothing like this or what we saw in, in 2019 and uh, ultimately 2021 um feel free to jump in and um, share your thoughts, cut me off, whatever. But let's let's go ahead and set the scene here. So um, this was an interesting time in Bucks history because this was year number three 
for George Carl as the uh, head coach of the Bucks. He had joined the team or came to Milwaukee for that strike, a lockout shortened season in the 98-99 season where the New York Knicks ultimately represented the East. The Bucks became a playoff team in the, uh, what, 50-game season, I think, that was played that year. They played the Indiana Pacers in the first round of the playoffs. They were a seven seed. The Pacers were the two seed. A lot of the same blueprints to that team. We'd see some tinkering made. Sam Cassell was newly acquired. You had uh, Glenn Robinson and Ray Allen. Um, but we would really start to see that team take shape over the course of the next two years. They were swept by the Pacers in the first round. But I think, and that's another thing to touch on, was just the arrival of George Carl and what that added for excitement as well as, you know, we'll get to some comments from Doc Rivers in 2001, but uh, there were certainly some George Carl detractors when you looked at the uh, Denver Nuggets beating the Sonics in the first round of the playoffs. And I think just overall his exit in Seattle, but he was a bona fide coach and mm -hmm. been through the era after Del Harris and, and Mike, you go to Mike Dunleavy and Chris Ford and everything else that, for the Bucks to get George Carl as their head coach, I think number one, that's where a lot of this excitement really started to build. Because when you look at what the Bucks had done before that, that's why there was excitement. Like, again, I think back to my lifetime. So I'm born, if I'm 12 and 01, meaning I was born in 89, like you look at the Bucks. 91, 92, 93, 94, yeah. 95, 96, 97. Like there are no playoffs within that stretch. It is just some very, very rough basketball going on. Now you have some fun guys that emerge on those teams. Like we had the big dog was the longest tenured buck at that time. I remember like yeah. with the one team. Um, so seeing him finally start to get some of that playoff success was sweet for that way, which I'm sure you, you remember very clearly given that big dog is your guy, but uh, George Carl coming to town I, at the time was like, you know, who is George Carl? I'm not super familiar with it, uh, but hearing my uncles talk about him and just being like, Oh, the bucks finally got them a real coach. Like, let's see what they can do with a real coach now. Like, if they don't do it with the real coach, like, these pieces here, like, big dogs, so like, they're going to have to disperse because it's not going to be it. Like, that's how I remember at that time the conversation being around the team where it's like, uh, we'll see. Like, the Bucks ain't been good since the 80s. Like, we'll see how this goes. But, like, but they got a good coach. So if he can't turn this around, we don't know what will at this point. Um, Frank Hamblin took over for Dell Harris after he resigned about 20 games into the season in the 91 calendar portion of the 91, 92 season. Then he had Mike Dunleavy for four years. Uh, that was really the first era of Bucks basketball that I remember. I was around 10 years old or so when he took over. And in, in three of those four years, the Bucks won less uh, 25 or less games around there uh, in the mid twenties. So that's, how bleak it was. Chris Ford, then we mentioned that name, um, comes over to take over after Mike Dunleavy left. He was coaching the Boston Celtics. Um, he had success early with Boston. Then as the team started to change and get a little bit younger, when guys like Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and that era of Celtics basketball started to go away, you saw the results start to go away. So that's what the Bucks went to next. And then the hiring of George Carl, who, again, um, brought the pedigree, brought a lot of recognition and attention. And we've talked about it with other teams and especially schools. When you think back to Bruce Pearl um, with the Milwaukee Panthers, when it's sometimes like this is what you need for that jolt of energy to get more investment in your fans and in the community and city and everywhere else. And there's no denying that's what the hiring of George Carl did. It put the Bucks to a lesser extent, on the map, and they were no longer the laughing stock or one of them in the league and, and kind of stuck in purgatory. So they go 28-22 and 22 in his first season. I mentioned they make the playoffs. They lose to the Pacers in a sweep, best of five, but all three of those games were pretty competitive. You go to the 99-2000 season, and they have another winning record. They go 42-40. and 40. They're the eighth seed. They lose to the Pacers again in the first round, something that we're very familiar with at this point, in another best of five that goes the distance. Another very, very competitive series that I think uh, Bucks fans will certainly remember the name of Travis Best. 
who basically shot the Bucks out of the playoffs with that corner three in the closing seconds of game five. But it was that moment that it, it kind of felt like, okay, they're headed towards something. They're building something here. So the expectations were very, very high going into that 2000-2001 um, season. In the offseason, I mentioned they would make some changes to the roster over the course of those two years after George Carl arrived. Uh, most of that heavy lifting was already done. So their big moves in the offseason, uh, remember Billy Owens? They traded Billy Owens to the Pistons for Lindsey Hunter, who was a pretty valuable piece in the regular yeah. season. The playoffs, especially late, would prove to be a different story. They signed Mark Pope, who was waived by the Pacers. They added Jerome Kersey uh, during the season. And um, Kersey essentially replaced Danny Manning, who we forget was a member of the Bucks in the late 90s. And then that summer in the draft, they added some guy named Michael Red in the yep. second round, and they traded Jason Collier, who was the 15th pick, to the Rockets for Joel Prisbilla. So those were their big changes. Prisbilla would play a decent amount. Michael Red, we wouldn't see a whole lot of until the following season. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mentioned Lindsey Hunter was a big piece for them, especially during the regular season. Mark Pope had, uh, by the time the season ended, basically replaced Marty Conlon as one of those fan favorite guys, especially in that playoff run. Uh, and Jerome Kersey, we saw for moments throughout the season. So uh, looking at the offseason for that Bucks team, it was the foundation is already here. How do we continue to add some role guys and sprinkle to this team where we can continue this growth? And that's what they did. Like when you think of the name, just like thinking about that season, you mentioned uh Kersey, where it's like Jerome Kersey. You don't think about Jerome Kersey and be like, that's that's such a valuable pickup in the offseason. But like he was the big bet on yeah. that particular Bucks team as well, which carries weight. We talk a lot about roster construction, how you need to have the right type of chemistry in the locker room, the right type of role guys on your team. And with the 01 Bucks in particular, like you mentioned, a lot of the big pieces were already in place. We knew the offensive scoring was going to come through Big Dog. It was going to come through Ray. It was going to come through Sam Cassell and even Tim Thomas off the bench because Tim Thomas himself, like that was a buck where it was like, I think he has some real potential here to, to, you know, really grow. Like he was, I think second and sixth man of the year voting yeah. that uh, in that season in particular. Um, so you had a lot of the scoring there. So being able to add some pieces that could play some defense, give you that veteran presence and also help steady the ship. I thought was really important for that particular team because uh, you need that, you need that good mix. And thinking about the rookie years of Joel Prisbella and, Michael Red just being like, wow, like that really was their very first year. And it's like Chris Bella played in a, like a third of the games where you're like seeing him getting his feet wet. Um, and like you said, Michael Red played even fewer than that. But yeah. uh, even getting Jason Caffrey over, like he had a ring with the Jordan Bulls as well. So mm -hmm. they were able to stockpile some vets and some guys around this team that I think just kind of hit the right buttons. Even Irvin Johnson on the team this year, like he came up big in yeah. certain times. Irvin, no magic. Like he, he had some, some, some big roles during that uh, that playoff run as well. Um, I do want to take a look at that name you mentioned, Jason Caffey. There's some interesting moments throughout the regular season that involved Jason Caffey. We'll take a look back at before we do step aside for our first break, though. Tim Thomas, um, I remember I loved Tim Thomas uh -huh. in my younger years. Maybe it was just the dual headband look that I think attracted me to him, but I loved Tim Thomas. And again, it was what the Bucks did around that era to win on the margins, uh, the mm -hmm. value that you got from Irvin Johnson, the trade that brought you Sam Cassell. I think it was Chris Gatling was really the big piece that they shipped out in um, that deal. The Tim Thomas trade, they sent Tyrone Hill in that failed era of Bucks basketball with Terrell Brandon. They sent Tyrone Hill and another young guy I do remember being very high on, Gerald Honeycutt to the 76ers. For Tim Thomas and Scott Williams, another very, very important piece yep. in the Bucks basketball. And, and that trade occurred uh, about a, a year and a half prior to this conference finals run. So we'll take a look at some of the memorable moments that stand out the most from an up and down regular season that eventually turned the way of the Bucks. We will get into that conversation coming up next here on Locked on Bucks. 
Well, time to talk to you about our friends over at Prize Picks. They are America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 5 million members. They are the most fun and exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports, players, and teams. You just pick more than or less than on two to six player stat categories and get a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. With Prize Picks, you could turn $10 into $1,000 in a single game watching your favorite sports this summer. You can make a Prize Picks lineup in as little as 60 seconds, and you just need to pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections. The finals mean more on Prize Picks, and so do the star players. You get boosted payouts on select basketball stars you won't find anywhere else and when the finals are over hoops action doesn't stop on prize picks women's basketball is just getting started you got caitlin clark and angel reese in the wnba you can utilize those two names on prize picks as well looking to make names for themselves alongside other greats in the league like aj wilson brianna stewart and more win up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out this summer it's very easy download the app today and use the code locked on nba for a first deposit match up to 100 dollars. again that code locked on nba prize picks pick more pick less it is that easy all right on to the regular season here camille so we mentioned the pieces that were already in place some of the tinkering that the bucks did to um supplement their roster but as you and i were talking about before we started recording this it got off to a rocky start and i do remember this getting kicked around a lot when you would look back it it seemed like everybody had a different inflection point of when you would say hey here's where the turnaround took place um the bucks weren't all that great in terms of their metrics And certainly the record for the first 30 to 35 games of the season, that's when you started to really see the uh, turnaround. They were 8-11 and at one point, albeit very, very early. But to me, the big uh, point on the calendar that stood out, they were 18-15 and on January 7th. And they would go 34-17 and the rest of the way. If you go back even further than that, though, I I said it's early, there was a game – in Milwaukee at the Bradley Center, I think it was it was the first week of December. It, I believe, it was an NBC game when when what's old is is new again. When they had the uh, basketball deals, and their their um, their marquee games would be Sunday afternoons. So this was a Sunday afternoon at the Bradley Center against the Indiana Pacers. The Bucks were somewhere around six and ten, six and nine, something like that uh, at that point. Not what we expected, right? We talked about this team being on the rise and building something. Not only was the record not great, the optics were even worse. Their their numbers were bad. They were losing in ugly fashion. And Glenn Robinson, Sam Cassell, and Jason Caffey all missed a team meeting. They were benched in the first quarter of the game against the Indiana Pacers. The Bucs ultimately won that game. And that seemed to be one of the early moments where this group was galvanized. They went 45 and 20 the rest of the way after that Pacers win. I think they went on an eight game win streak or they won eight of their next nine or 10 games. And it was slowly but surely they started to build something. Everything started to click, especially with that trio of Sam Cassell, Ray Allen, and uh, Glenn Robinson. We fast forward to the end of the year, the Bucs win 52 games. It was the most they had won since 1986 when they won 57 games 13th time in team history they won 50 or more games and the first time they were division champions since that same 1986 season and um the last thing i'll I'll mention and get your thoughts on here was we mentioned it was ugly in terms of some of their metrics and numbers and the the win-loss record down the stretch, especially when you look at where this team finished, I think it speaks to just how elite this group was playing for really the last three months of the regular season. As they wrapped up the season number two in offensive rating, number seven in net rating. They were second in the league in both three point attempts and makes. And, you know, we mentioned that name of uh, Tim Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, this team 
looking back at it and the memories that we have of watching them, you can't help but think these were some of the predecessors. They were really ahead of their time where it wasn't five out with Irvin Johnson. Um, but this was at least four out in those lineups where you would play Tim Thomas, even Mark Pope, not a, a sharp shooter, but Mark Pope had a baseline jumper that this was really uh, not a full scale revolution of here's how the game is going to be played. But a lot of pieces to that 2001 team, you think back to, yeah, you could do that now in the league today. Yeah, one thing that was interesting, like going back and looking at some of the game footage of basketball being played during that time, uh, just how many shots came from the elbows. Like even when bigs, like you already mentioned, they don't stretch out the floor completely at that time. But from baseline shots or working the elbows, like you did see a lot of bigs trying to get that shot off and the Bucks had a few guys uh, who could knock that down as well, in addition to the three-point shooting that we know of with Ray Allen, who I always felt like, not before his time, but like the three-point shot, he got to play it for a very long time. But like if his volume was even increased because he was a 43% like three-point shooter, I find it impressive what Chris Middleton has done in the the franchise record books. And then when I went back to look at it and seeing how few attempts Ray Allen was doing it and just the efficiency, like that always jumps off the screen to me. So in addition to Ray Allen, you mentioned Tim Thomas, who was also a plus 40% three-point shooter. Lindsey Hunter was knocking him yep. down. Now, Sam Cassell yep. didn't have the numbers, but people respected the shot enough to not just leave him out there. And he was the close. clutch guy on the Yes, team. yes. And he would come clutch through with some clutch mid-range shots. A lot of the yeah. time as well. Just a big shot maker. Um, you mentioned that game against Indiana. That was a turning point for you. Before we started recording, I mentioned, like, I remembered them losing at the beginning. But I didn't realize that they had lost that many games early on. Uh, it was actually had, like, an eight-game win streak in January. Yeah. And that was when I remember being like, oh, okay, like, there. It's not Here's just one game. Then, you know, you, you win two, you lose one. You, you win two, you lose two. Like, they finally were able to rattle off some games consistently. And they had a really good January. Um, and that's when I remember being like, this team might be able to do something special because uh, you started seeing them put it together. And then to go on to win the Central Division, which – at that time, which also made me laugh, where I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot there only used to be two divisions in each conference. So winning your division, uh, you had a lot more teams to go through at that time than what we have now with the three divisional It system. was something so, to be proud of. <laughs> yeah, truly. Like, truly. Like, when you look at it, you're like, dang, is this the conference list? You're like, oh, wait, no, this is just the division. It's only two of them here. So uh, it was difficult, and the Bucks really came through with that. And I was just remember being like, I've never seen them be this good. Like, yeah. let's see what the playoffs bring because what Ray Allen was doing, what you were seeing with Big Dog, uh, Lindsey Hunter was somebody who, for some reason, I really liked. <laughs> like, it was just a random, like, I like Lindsey Hunter. I think he's a really good basketball player. And for, you know, when you're younger, it's always one guy where you're just like, something about mm -hmm. him. So I was disappointed to spoiler alert when Lindsey Hunter was only here for a year um, instead of, you know, staying on board. But yeah, that January stretch for me is when I really was like, I think that this Bucks team might be able to win. Now, my uncles weren't as uh, bought in. They didn't have much belief <laughs> as I did at that they, time. They were like, used to decades of the previous. Exactly. Bucks. Exactly. Like, that's cute. But like, let's see how this actually shakes out. Um, yeah. Lindsey Hunter was, you know, when we talk about the way that the Bucks could space the floor, mm -hmm. Lindsey Hunter was was one of those guys with his uh, shooting ability. We'll get to it when we uh, take a look at, at the playoffs. It would become a different story, but he, he came to the Bucks from the Pistons, where the the previous season he shot forty three percent on his threes and took about five per game. Which, mm -hmm. you know, granted, you didn't have the volume of guys taking quite as many threes as it seems like now you'll have five to six guys on a roster that take five or more threes per game. Uh, but Lindsey Hunter, one of the elite shooters out there in the league, shot 43% on threes prior to joining the uh, the Bucks, And even his one year in Milwaukee, he was a 37% three-point shooter. It was just, man, what about the playoffs, Lindsey? That's what we really, really needed that shooting. 15% um, on threes in the postseason in that uh, 2001 run with the bucks and you know it's it's i think the other thing that we'll get to is as we'll we'll save the postseason because there's a lot of conversations to be had about that playoff run and the intrigue behind each of those series we're going to break that off into a part two here 
Um, but coming back from the break, I want to talk about the optimism, what you mentioned, your belief in this team, the fact that I think anybody that was older or slightly <laughs> older than we were that experienced not just the bad eras of Bucks basketball, but even those teams in the 80s that were good but just couldn't get over the hump. There was the Celtics or the Hawks or the Sixers that were standing in their way, and that kind of beat you down to think, yeah, it's, it's just not going to happen. The numbers that inspired that confidence that a lot of us that were probably too naive and too young to know any better had, I want to get into that conversation coming up here after the break on Locked on Bucks. Well, if you're watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and have to turn down the volume with all the shouting, it's time to make the switch to Locked On Sports today. They're a free 24-7 sports streaming channel that is programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all of that screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, news, and it streams 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Um, this is the other thing I think that that probably gets referenced the most. We could put together a, a Mount Rushmore of what are things that we mentioned the most about that 2001 uh, Bucks team. Two of them we're definitely going to get to in the playoff discussion. But one of those, when I talked about you explaining your confidence and your belief in the team, me as well, anybody else, all my friends that were watching the games together, feeling the same way, a big, big reason for that was we would point to one stat, and that stat was 8-0. and o. The Bucks went 8-0 and o that year against the top West. four seeds from the West. Yeah, they swept the Spurs. I remember watching both of those games because I think they were both on Channel 18. They swept the Lakers, they swept the Kings, and they swept the Utah Jazz. So there was this... Not only is, you know, I, I think there was this stigma that, you know, Charles Barkley has talked about a lot of jump shooting teams don't win. And that kind of held true until we saw the Golden State Warriors break that in uh, the mid 2010s. But I think that was a big thing that people would, would kind of use to diminish the Bucks of, yeah, Ray Allen and Sam Cassell and Glenn Robinson, they're good players. Uh, Ray and Glenn were all stars that year. Okay. But uh, they're not Allen Iverson. They're not Kobe Bryant. They're not that uh, tier or level of player. It's, it's I suppose, funny that it's kind of the same conversation we're having about the Boston <laughs> Celtics. But um, people would point to that and, well, they're a jump shooting team. But I think we would all push back with, all right, I understand it's the regular season. It wasn't quite the era that it is now where the regular season and playoffs were two drastically different things. And we would point to, well, explain this then. How have the Bucks swept all four of those teams in the conference that is viewed as the better conference? That was like you mentioned, the confidence. And that is why. I know we're going to get to it in the next episode. And that is why them losing that Eastern Conference Finals bothered me and so many other people so much, I think, because it was like, yeah. I think a lot of Bucks fans had the confidence that that Bucks team could have beat those L.A. Lakers. Now, whether that is true or not, we will never know. We can do a 2K simulation. I'm gonna. I don't think they would have beaten that Lakers team. <laughs> there, but, listen, Justin. There are gonna be some people. I guarantee you, in the comments, there's gonna be some people saying like, "No, Justin, we would have beat that Lakers team." But I think I the Bucks. I, I don't think they would have beat them. But competitive. Yeah, right. I then think it would have been a more competitive seven. series. Maybe they take two games. Um, and I, I think we are all pleased too that as that series unfolded the, between the Sixers and the Lakers. You had the Sixers improbably winning game one with the iconic mm -hmm. moment of AI stepping over Ty Lue. Um, I think when that game happened, you had a lot of people, myself included, like, holy cow, what's what's going on here? And then the Lakers promptly won four straight games. Yeah. And you started to hear a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit. And I, I think, look, if, if that happened today in the day and age of everybody having a podcast – you would have heard, you would have heard a lot more of you know the Bucks would have made this a more competitive series. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would have beaten the Lakers, but I, I think you would have seen X, Y, and Z. And you heard a little bit of that as we moved into the uh, off season, which again, similar to what we talked about coming into 2000 to 2001, led to even more optimism of okay, you you got to do things in steps. And this team took a giant leap to win in the first round 
for the first time in 12 years. And not only that, reached the conference finals. This group is relatively young. They're all under contract. We should be able to keep this thing together for the foreseeable future. This team is headed somewhere. And as we'll get to at the back <laughs> half of uh, part number two, that, that just was not the case. I'm still disappointed about that, Justin. I, I've made jokes saying I, I still have some some hard feelings towards George Carl uh, <laughs> because I put for years I put that at, at the at his feet. Like this team was not this team anymore because George Carl wanted to make some roster changes. But we're not there yet. We're not at that point. What I will say one more thing just about the regular season that that particular Milwaukee Bucks team had um, and heading into the playoffs. I remember thinking like, oh, hey, it does not look like we're going to play the Pacers again for the third year in a row in the playoffs. So I was like, OK, like let's let's shake this part off and let's get past this, because as we mentioned, the first two years, it was against the Pacers, swept the first time, taking the distance the second time around. But I was like, OK, at first I was like, I want to see the Pacers again. Like, let's let's get this again. And then when I saw it wasn't going to happen, I was like, actually. I'm okay with that. Not to say like, you know, I didn't think that they could win, but it was like, let's, let's see something different. Um, and at that time too, I was a big T-Mac fan. Like T-Mac was one of those guys. So being able to be like, Oh, we get to see him in the playoffs was exciting. Now we'll talk about that series more in the next part, but um, yeah, it was just a lot of excitement. Um, something you never saw before with that Bucks team. And again, like I mentioned, just the city being behind it where it was just like, this feels different. Like that's when Bradley center, like I was hearing like the fortress on the fourth. Like I remember watching those games and being like, I don't remember hearing the crowd this loud ever before. Yeah. yeah. It was something the, the way that that crowd was really into it. I think you saw moments of that in 2010 as well with the fear of the deer team. Um, it, it's tough to make the comp when you move to Fiserv forum, mm -hmm. uh, even the final game that was played in the Bradley Center, I still remember in that series against the Boston Celtics, where the Bucks held serve. They won their three games and sent the Bradley Center out a winner, something that didn't experience much of in its heyday. Um, but that crowd and the the energy in the Bradley Center around this team in 2001 was uh, certainly something. And that Pacers thing, that, that was one of the things that stood out to me the most was I, re I vividly remember those two series against the Pacers in the two years prior. And in going through and cleaning things up with some of the research and realizing you may have misremembered some things about 2001, I remember thinking the same thing of, wait a minute, what, what happened to the Pacers? Because they were in the East, they were in the finals the year prior and assuming, well, there had to have been that had to have been the off season when Jalen Rose left or other guys started to leave, but no, it was just the bucks and the Allen Iverson, the Ascension from those guys uh, really being that in the Pacers on the other end of the spectrum, getting older that they took a step back and were the eight seed that you're playing the uh, 76ers. They were 500 the that year, round. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was an interesting year all around, all across the board, but nothing was more interesting than the playoffs that Ooh. year and what we saw from the Bucks. Each of the three series they were in were ripe with storylines and memorable moments. We're going to get into that conversation and, of course, the ultimate ending to that postseason run and what we saw that lead to, which um, I think robbed a lot of Bucks fans of the joy that they had following this team. So we'll get into – the postseason conversation about the 2001 playoff run with this Bucks team on part two of this Flashback Friday episode next on Locked on Bucks.